Maybe you can help him get another flashlight. Uh, Marashi, it's on, it's on. Mm. So we are continuing with in our study um, of the gifts. Remember, we started a long time ago with uh, the study of the foundation gifts. Now we are doing the building. The foundation is done. Now we are doing the building gifts. Now we are building on top of the foundation. And the building gifts, they are found in Romans chapter 12, as we already started two weeks ago. I'm going to do a bit of a recap. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a catch up of where we were and where we are going. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to also share <laughs> the message. Uh, but um, let's, let's open Romans chapter 12 and we will read from verse 1 until verse 8 because that is our main text on the building gifts. Romans chapter 12 from verse 1 until verse 8. Romans chapter 12 yes. verse 1 to 8. Hmm. Uh, it reads, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, mm. in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, mm. holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Mm. Verse 2 Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, mm. then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Mm. Verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, yes. do not think of yourself more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment mm -hmm. in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Mm. For just as each of us has one body with many members, mm. and these members do not all have the same function, mm -hmm. so in Christ we, though many, form one body. Yes. And each member belongs to all other, to all the others. Mm. Verse 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Mm. If your gift is prophesying, then prophecy is accordance with your faith. Mm -hmm. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then they teach. teach. Mm. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. Mm. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, to do, do it diligently. Mm. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Amen. That is the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your throne of grace and we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to come together as a church and to read and to hear from you, Lord. And now, may Mulumua Kao Papa, may it be used by you, Holy Spirit, to teach us, to correct us, and to edify us in order to do your will and for your glory to be exalted above all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We just read from verse 1 of Romans chapter 12 until verse 8. Remember the gifts that of the Holy Spirit that he gave us. Those gifts, the main purpose of the gifts are to build other people, other believers up, not yourself. So there's not even one gift listed here that is for the benefit of the person who has the gift. So that is very important to know to and to emphasize because all the gifts that God is giving to each individual is for the benefit of other people in the church. 
so that the saying is true that iron sharpens iron. Iron does not sharpen itself. Another iron must sharpen it. So we are as well as Christians. We are sharpened by others all the time. So uh, let's be careful about that and let's note that as we are entering into this teaching gift. The teaching gift, I want to clap it together with exhortation because it is not easy to just teach without exhorting. They go hand in glove. Uh, you can't use the glove without the hand, neither can you use the glove without the hand. So, gift of teaching and exhortation, they go together all the time. They're always together. So, we will explain what is the gift of teaching. But before we go into the gift today, I promise that we will do a recap. That's why we read from verse 1 until verse 8, because that's where we started. Now, in verse 1, we'll see three things here. In verse 1 until verse 2 is where we, we saw our position, our position. In verse 1, it says there, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice. How? As holy. And we saw last time that holy means we, we must be separated for God's glory, for God's work. That's us as believers. Believers must be, holy doesn't mean perfect. Holy just means separated for the work of, of God, for the service to God. That's how we as believers ought to be. And then it says we must, that's our position. We must be separated, number one. And then Number two, we must make sure that we are acceptable to God. And how can we be acceptable to God? We saw uh, in our introduction to this series of the building gifts that uh, to be acceptable to God, you need to be obedient. If he says all people must repent, that's an instruction. And when you obey it, then you become acceptable to God. So that's what it means. We, well, I won't go there because we covered that in our first session, our introduction. It's just a catch up. And then verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 continues to say, now you are separated, you are obedient, you are acceptable to God, therefore do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, how? How can you not conform to the pattern of this world? Then he goes on to describe it. By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. And to, we saw last time that to renew your mind, you need to study God's word. You need to study God's word. And with the intention not to debate, but with the intention to obey and to live according to the word. And on top of that, we continue to say, then he continues, when you're renewing your mind, then you will be able to discern and to be able to test and discern what is the will of God. And we saw that to discern is to differentiate between what is good and what is evil. And you choose what is good intentionally. Apart from the way the world does things, because we saw, or we see, or the, in now in our world, that which is evil is now defended as if it's good, and we we gave examples, and the main example to 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 see that is homosexuality. Homosexuality is a sin that is protected, as if it's a good thing. It's evil. It's like protecting theft. How can you defend people who are stealing? It's the same thing. So now, people who are practicing homosexuality are protected by our government. And uh, that is an example of showing that there is a problem when it comes to being depraved as men. It's just evidence that as people, without Christ, we are depraved. We end up calling that which is evil and we say it is good and even fight the good people that are trying to correct or to point those people to repent. And then we say they, that's hate speech. That's our world that, that we live in. 
And then, that is our position. Our position is that we need to be separated. We need to be holy, separated. We need to be obedient, and we need to com not conform to the pattern of this world by the renewing of our mind, as we are able to discern between good and evil. But we are armed by the word. We are using the word, not our personal opinions. And then, verse 3, between verse 3, 4, and 5, that's in Romans chapter 12, that's where we see our approach. Our approach. What's that? Our attitude. Our attitude is that of belonging. We have to go with belonging. Look at verse 3. It says there, for, this is why, for the grace given to me, because he's an apostle, the grace that was given to him was that he's an apostle. And remember, uh, as an apostle in the foundational gifts, we saw that as an apostle, he is the foundation that on which we need to build on. The teachings that come from an apostle are the doctrines that we build upon those who come after. So none of us today in here can or will be an apostle. Even if you call yourself that, you are not. <laughs> All right. Because the foundation cannot be built twice. So let's continue about our approach. The att attitude is, he says, to everyone among you, this is all those who are believers in the, in the place, Rome. He says, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to. Never think of yourself as more important than other people. That's our approach. Our approach is that you look at the next person as better than you, always. Always. That's how we need to approach this. In, you'll see why. So we need to be humble. And here's how it is. It but to think with sober judgment. Judgment means to decide or to... Uh, to arbitrate, Nalin Tobarki CCMA, the Commission of Conciliation, Mediation, and Arbitration. What that does is, after you go through the process of not being happy with your employer, the arbitrator then makes the final decision. And his decision, you cannot go to court and fight against it. His decision is final. And that's what we ought to do. We must arbitrate, we must think soberly with that attitude of judging that we ourselves are not important than the next person. Because the next person is the one we always have to look at as better than us. That is humility. That is humility. And that, that promotes interdependence. And then verse 4. Then he continues. Oh, sorry. In still in verse 3, verse 3b, three each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, this one we saw that the measure is our approach. The measure of faith just means God gave you a certain level, at your certain level where you are, of your spiritual growth or your influence, your area of influence. That's the measure. It's, it's two ways. It's either your measure is your influence how many people can you influence? Whenever you speak, how many people listen? And those people who listen, those are your measure of faith. And then your other measure is your level of spiritual growth, your level of understanding of the word of God. How far are you in understanding God's word? That's your measure. According to that, he, he knows us better than we know ourselves, by the way. So he gives us according to the measure of our faith. And that faith, remember, is not even your own faith, by the way. It is assigned to you, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. God gives, gives it to you. Remember, faith that we have in Christ is also a gift, according to Ephesians chapter 2, right? Look at verse 4. For as one body we have many members, and the and we are members, and members do not all have the same function. We don't have the same function. If I'm able to teach, I might not be able to serve. And somebody 
who serves, I need that person. <laughs> we need one another. We need each other. Or I might have the gift of serving, but not the gift of teaching. So, but I need somebody to teach me the word of God, to explain it to me. We're going to break it down. So we though many are one body, the emphasis there is unity. Though we are many, we are one body, and we are individuals, individually members to one another. We belong together. That is our approach. We belong together. And then uh, verse, from verse 6 until verse 8, that is our grace. Our grace. Apostle Paul is here in verse 6. He calls our gifts the grace. Listen to this. He says, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And remember, we, we said, uh, we saw that grace, what the word grace means, it just means undeserved favor. The favor we did not deserve. We deserve to go to hell because we are sinners. And the wages of sin is death. And death means separation from God eternally. That's what death means. That's why there are others who will experience the second death. And the second death is the one where you are completely separated, alienated from God forever. That's death. We deserve that kind of death. But grace appeared. And in the form of Christ, the one we just celebrated and remembered, the sacrifice he just did for all of us. When we do the communion like this, we remember that he came with grace and truth. That's what he came with. Things we don't deserve. And that grace and truth was even extended to us. And another thing I need to repeat again and again is that whereas, as we are going through the gifts, these gifts are, are not talents. They are not natural. They are spiritually given. And they are given only because they are exclusive. They are only given to those who believe in Jesus Christ. If you don't believe in Christ, you cannot exercise any of these gifts. They are not for unbelievers. Yes, unbelievers can give money. Unbelievers can uh, have mercy on somebody. But that is not the spiritual gift. Because... We saw last time that the spiritual gift, the aim of the gift is to point people to Christ, to show Christ to people. Now, if you are giving and you are just showing the name of your company to advertise it, you are not doing exercising the spiritual gift. You are doing marketing. <laughs> so let's not confuse that. So let's start with the first one. We saw the gift of prophecy. We, did, we explained that this prophecy here is the gift of speaking forth, preaching, declaring, proclaiming God's word. And then we saw that gifts, gift of service and helping last week, which is the gift of uh, coming alongside someone to help them in their need. And then today we see the gift of teaching and exhortation. The gift of teaching and exhortation. When we define it, the gift of teaching is actually the ability to understand truth and to systematically break it down and explain it to someone else. That is the gift of teaching. That is what me and Muruti are doing every week. It's a gift of teaching. Elders have to have the gift of teaching, according to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. You cannot be an elder of a church if you are not able to teach. That's a qualification. All leaders of the church, especially elders, must be able to teach. It's a qualification. And who notices that gift? The church. The church will notice that Musa has a gift of teaching. Therefore, we recommend Musa to lead us. That's where the church recognizes. Because remember, you become the, gift, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are with every believer. 
All of us have those gifts. And they manifest even before you are given an office or you are an elder or you are a pastor. Even before you are given those titles, the gift operates because it's a function. It's a doing act. It's what you do. And it's what you love to do. Last week, I asked these two questions. What bothers you in the church? What worries you about a church service when we are inside the church? Or about the church's ministry? Whatever bothers you, that's an indication. That's how the Holy Spirit exposes your gift. And you will see yourself worried, concerned, and you want to fill that gap. And that is why the instruction is, let us use the gifts that are given to us. It's an instruction. You cannot instruct a person to use what you have as if they don't have it. They have it. That's why the word of God says here, let us use these gifts that are given to us by grace. Let's use them in the church. When you are worried about something, don't sit back, criticize. Ah, wanna bashota there, bashota there. Oh, the fact that you are seeing them, that shows that's your, your assignment. Go and fill the gap. And that's how a church is built. Because a church is not, let us say, we are in Murudira Maroka's ministry. It's a social community church. It belongs to the community, to the glory of Christ, the one who died for not in Muruti Le Ntatesial, but he died for all who are coming here. And those who come here and believe in Christ, he has given them these gifts. And when you see a gap, fill it. Then you glorify him. So that is the definition. Gift of teaching is just the ability to systematically break down the gift. Baba they might say, yeah, well, uh, women also have the gift of teaching, which is true. But they cannot be elders. <laughs> and the fact that you have, a, you, are a, you have a gift of teaching doesn't mean you must be an elder or you must be a pastor. Teachers are not only pastors. Let's, let, let me, let, let's, let, let's go back a little bit. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and let's see what a teaching. Every, this teaching extends beyond the pulpit, the gift of teaching. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 there, you'll see verse 7. It says there, it's an instruction from the Lord. You shall teach Okay, let's start from um, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's start with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. Verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. That is God's instruction to all Israel, not to the elders of Israel only. And then in Ephesians Chapter 5, he continues with the same instruction. It was quoted also from there. No, actually Ephesians chapter 6. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 6 and let's see the extension of the gift of teaching. Verse 1, children, obey your parents. Ephesians chapter 6. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well, uh, go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up. How? In the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is an instruction not only to fathers, but to their mothers as well. Because Mama Kasiri, this verse doesn't talk about me. It does. <laughs> it talks about parents. And, and children spend more time with, with mothers anyway. 
more than with fathers, generally speaking. And that is an instruction. It's a responsibility of parents to teach children the truth of his way in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We don't teach them our own opinions. We teach them God's word. And then let's go to Titus and then we are going to see that there are women, there are men, young men, with the gift of teaching as well. In Titus, look at verse 3. Titus chapter 2. Look at verse 3 there. It says there, Older women likewise. Okay, let's start from the beginning. But as for you, teach what accords to sound doctrine. Teach. Listen to verse 2. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. And, now it comes to women. Older women, likewise, just like the older men, they are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Not, welcome, welcome, mama. Not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and to train young women to love their husbands and children. Do you see this? About the gift of teaching. So, women with the gift of teaching, verse 4 of Titus chapter 2, explains who they must teach. <laughs> verse 4 says, and so they must train the young women to love their husbands and their children. And verse 5 continues that they must be taught to be self-controlled, pure, and they must be working at home. Those are the teachings that women who have the gift of teaching must teach. And they are taught to be kind and submissive to their own husbands, not to Murut. They must not start calling Muruti Papa here. They must be obedient to their, submissive to their own husbands at home. There. So that the word of God may not be reviled. Do you see how the gift of teaching must permeate? The gift of teaching must dominate in the church. Older men must teach younger men. Older women must teach younger women. And then, when you continue to verse 6, it continues. Likewise, urge Bumusa, younger men, to do what? To be self-controlled, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works, and in all your teaching, show integrity and dignity. Integrity and dignity. Meaning, you are many of your word. So that is the gift of teaching. It goes beyond just the pulpit. Let's go together. I believe I've shown you what the gift of teaching is and how it is very important in the church. And in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where we read when we started, it says that you need to renew your mind. You cannot renew your mind apart from God's word. The word of God itself is the one that renews because it's living and sharper than any double-edged sword. And it is there to convict us and to lead us into truth. And it sanctifies us as well. We are being sanctified by God's word. So, now we go to the next question. What does the gift of teaching entail? What does the gift of teaching entail? How does it look like? Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And Brother Beggy, I'm going to ask you to read for us here. 
First Timothy chapter 4 Look at verse 13 until verse 16 please First Timothy chapter 4 verse 18 to verse 16 It says Until I come Yes Devote yourself to the public reading of scripture mm -hmm. To preaching and to teaching mm. Do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Mm. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Mm. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your, your hearers. This is the Apostle Paul instructing Pastor Timothy, who was pastoring a church there in Ephesus. As an elder, he's telling him what the gift of teaching that he has, what it entails, how it needs to be practiced. Because remember, when you have the, a gift, do it. That's the instruction. Do your gift. Practice your gift in the church. Because remember, last time we asked Tori, if the hand decides not to work, the body is handicapped, it's crippled. That's what we call it, it's imbalanced. So we need you, we need your gifts in the body of Christ. Use them. Here is an instruction specifically about the gift of teaching. If you have it, it says here, devote yourself to public reading of God's word. Read God's word. And you don't just read it. You read and encourage those who are listening to you. Brother Becky, you have your crowd there. Your crowd is mama and the, the, the son. Teach them. Open the word. Teach as the father. We saw from Ephesians chapter 6 that as a father... You need to teach in the instruction of the Lord and discipline. And you enforce for the name of the Lord not to be reviled, not to be embarrassed by your son. <laughs> so you teach your son and you discipline him to obey God's word. <laughs> not because when I, it's for you. It's not for you, by the way. It's so that the name of the Lord can be glorified. So, devote yourself, and devotion, this word is powerful. You need to be devoted, which means you need to be consistent in season and out of season, in fashion, and when even out of fashion. When, it's, when mama supports you and when she's not supporting you, you teach the word, you teach. <laughs> and mama, the same thing. You teach God's word to your family. That's your area of influence. Amen. And then, how it looks like is, exhortation is to apply. We're going to look at that in the second part of the sermon. And to teach is to explain. You need to explain. And verse 14 of 1 Timothy chapter 4 that you just read now, it says, do not neglect this gift. It's very important never to neglect it. Let's not neglect the gift. And then, verse 15 says, practice what you are preaching. <laughs> you don't just devote yourself to public reading of God's word. You don't just enjoy explaining to others what the word of God is. But, verse 15, practice these things. Be an example. Titus, we saw that his, uh, Titus was exhorted, who was a pastor in Crete there, to be an example in those things. Whatever you're teaching, be an example. So that everyone can see your progress. Bauli village, I think they're watching. Okay, you say we should do one, two, three, but where now are you doing it? Practice what you preach. 
And then immerse yourself in them, in these teachings. Immerse yourself. Let them dominate your thinking, dominate your life, dominate your Monday to Friday. It shouldn't be a Sunday thing. <laughs> the Word of God, it's a Monday to Friday thing as well. In, the, in your work that you do, in your conversations that you have, the Word of God must be there. So you practice it so that people can see it. You see, verse 15, so that all may see your progress. They will see your progress. Oh, Becky started here. He's teaching us some of these things and he's doing them himself. It should be visible. Practice what you preach. What you preach. And then verse 16. Remember, this is what the gift of teaching entails. From here where we are looking, verse Timothy chapter 4, verse 13 until verse 16, we saw so far that you need to be devoted to the reading of Scripture, to the explaining of it. Don't be tired of explaining it. And then, verse 15, practice it so that people can see your progress. And in verse 16, it says, keep a close watch on yourself. Be careful. Watch yourself. Basically saying, watch yourself. Don't ever get relaxed and think you know it all. Just because you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, then you think you know everything. now. Then you relax. Never relax. Or we are giving you Musa to teach on Tuesday. And you say, oh, I did this before, man. It's easy. I'll prepare two minutes before we start. Because I know it. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. Be devoted. Be diligent. Be immersed by this. So that you teach what you are practicing. And then it continues. Persist in this. We are asked not to teach certain things from the Bible. It's coming. Other countries are already doing it. Le Morne, we are not exonerated, it's coming. But it says persist. Even when you are told not to do it, teach the word in season and out of season. Persist. Be persistent. And by so doing, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. And you see, he's not saying the church. Meaning, the gift of teaching doesn't end here. You can teach your family, your cousins that don't know the truth. You know it. You're exposed to it. Teach them. Open the Bible. Everybody are gathering there. Before they drink alcohol and they dance and get crazy, so just say, let's open with a word of prayer. Do it. Stand up and just say, look, I'm just going to... And before praying, then you just read a portion of scripture and teach then, because by so doing, you are saving them. They will be saved. One of them, it's a seed that you are planting and it will grow. Don't be shy. I mean, it's your family members. Well, I mean, what can go wrong? <laughs> and I, I'm sure if you ask, anywhere you go, if you ask, let's just open with a word of prayer. No one will ever say no to that. There's no one that ever says, yeah, we don't want prayer here. They don't do that. What they don't want is Jesus. But when I can pray, but don't talk about Jesus. <laughs> so let's be persistent in all of this. And then let's go to Acts chapter 18. We see that there are two ways. In Acts chapter 18, we'll see two ways that we practice the gift of teaching. In public and in private. In public and in private. Acts chapter 18. Chapter 18, look at verse 11. Started from verse, 12, uh, verse 10, 10 and 11. Verse 10. Yeah. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in the Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Do you see that? That's public ministry of Apostle Paul. 
when he was there. Verse 10 is God, Jesus, telling him that there are many people in this city, don't worry. Why not? Then the very next verse, then he started. He stayed there for a year. What was he doing? He was teaching people publicly, teaching them God's word. And go to verse 26, the same chapter, verse 26, and let's see the private. It started from verse 25, I mean 24, 25, 26. Let's see the context of it there. Private teaching now. Verse 24. Mm. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, yes. a native of Alexandria, mm. came to Ephesus. Yes. He was a learned man mm. with a thorough knowledge of the scripture. Mm -hmm. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, mm. and he spoke with great favor, and he taught about Jesus accurately. Yes. Though he knew only the baptism of, of, God. of John. Yeah. Verse 26. Yes. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Mm -hmm. When Priscilla and Aquila had him, mm. they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Yes. Do you see that? So Priscilla and Aquila, after hearing that Apos Apollos, he's a good teacher of the Bible, but he only knows the baptism of John, John the Baptist. He doesn't know about Jesus and his baptism of, 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 uh, of salvation. So then they called him Rao, privately so. And then they taught him, they explained to him more accurately the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see this? So that is the public and private ministry of the teaching, of the, of the, of the teaching gift that we need to practice. Don't, be sh don't shy away from it. I urge you and I encourage you, if you have that gift of teaching, use it. Use it. Now, let's look at the gift of exhortation. In Romans chapter 12, when we look at verse 4, it says, the one who exhorts must do that in his exhortation. And when we define exhortation, exhortation is to urge to encourage, to prod, to push someone in, in a nice way though, not forcefully, <laughs> to encourage someone uh, to instruct the mind so that they are able to do that which is instructed in teaching. In teaching, we explain. Okay, in preaching, we declare. Here is what God says, repent. You are a sinner, Repent. That's preaching. It's a declaration. Ne? And then, teaching is how? How do I repent? Then we explain. How do you repent? By putting your trust in Christ Jesus. Right? That's teaching. Okay. But, then I must be encouraged now. What, what is the exhortation? What is the encouragement to actually go in? Do that which I'm declared, instructed, and explained, but now I need to be encouraged. And that's where the gift of encouragement comes in. Let's have a look. Let's dig in with it. What does it, the importance of this gift? Remember, we're looking at the definition, the importance, and what it entails. Just like we did when we looked at teaching. We looked at uh, the definition, the importance of it, and what it entails. In Titus chapter 1, okay, let's not go there. Um, chapter 1 verse 9, let's not read it because we want to save time. In Titus chapter 1 verse 9, the gift of exhortation there is shown that it urges people to think biblically. And you cannot think biblically if you're not reading God's word. So you need to read God, and you can't read the God, God's word and understand it if you are not even saved in the first place. So you need to be saved because when you are saved by God, he gives the desire to want to know what the word of God says. Because remember, according to Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 9 and 10, we are naturally sinners and we reject God. We don't want God in anything that we do. So if you see yourself having interest to understand God, then you know it's a gift from God of salvation. 
That's regeneration because we are dead in our sins naturally. That's why I need to go back there because many times we miss it right here. We think a person's talent is his gift. It's not. So the gift of encouraging encourages others to think biblically in Titus chapter 1 verse 9. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we will read it now. They, it encourages people to grow spiritually and to do moral choices that please God. Because we are all saved from sin, by the way. We are not only saved from going to hell. We are saved from our own sin. Because we don't have power over our sin, naturally. Because you end up just sinning even when you don't want to sin. Because it controls you. You are a slave to sin, naturally. We are slaves to sin. And then Christ takes out that slave relationship we have with sin. And then he gives us the ability and the empowerment to defeat sin. But that doesn't mean you are not tempted. You will still be tempted. But you have the power to say no this time. Before you couldn't. Before Christ. And then, another way of exhortation is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4. Is to comfort. Another word for exhortation is to comfort others with the word of God. If you get to a family where somebody just passed away, you cannot go there and start preaching to them. No, you need to exhort, comfort their hearts. With the word of God still, we use the word in everything. You exhort them and encourage them to repent. And remember, we're doing it in all angles, in all angles. If you are on the street, you are preaching repentance. If you are in a church, people are here, you teach the word so that people can amend their ways with Christ, right? When you are in a funeral at a place in the family, you are exhorting them, encouraging them to repent. So you see the key word, we still teach repentance. Because that's what Christianity is all about. It's all about repentance. I always say, as Christians, we are perpetual repenters. <laughs> because we sin. We are still sinners, but we repent. Christians are just sinners that repent. <laughs> and then a non-believer or a person who doesn't believe in Christ, who is not a Christian, is just a sinner that does not repent. That's the difference. So... Open 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We're going to look at what it entails. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're looking at we're looking at verse 3 and we'll skip and look at verse 11. Just read 1, 2, and 3 and then we'll skip to verse 11 and 12. First Thessalonians verse chapter two, chapter two, verse one. One, two, three. Yes. You know, brothers and sisters, mm. that our visit to you was not without result. Yes. We had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know. But with the help of our God. We dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. Mm -hmm. Verse 3. For the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives. <laughs> there no, you go. We are trying to treat you. Yeah, just pause there before we go to verse 11. What it entails, the gift of exhortation. He says here, our appeal, that is exhortation, our appeal does not spring from error, but from truth. So you exhort with the truth, not with a lie, which means you don't motivate people to feel good about their sin. No, that's not, that's the exhortation or appeal that comes from error. You don't encourage people 
to feel good and tell them, no, God loves you just the way you are. That's a lie. He doesn't love you the way you are. He hates sin and those who practice it. And therefore you must stop and repent. Do you see the exhortation, the difference? Another one comes and say, you are fine the way you are. The way you are doing is fine. Just pray to him, he listens. He doesn't listen to prayer of sinners. That's not the truth. You know, to tell them the truth. He listens to the prayer of the righteous, which availeth much, according, according to James. So, is, the, the gift of exhortation, you exhort, encourage people with the truth. That's why I avoid using the word motivate, because it is hijacked by liars who are making people feel good about their sin. And then, he doesn't end there with error, but with impurity. So it's based on the truth and with purity, not impurity. Impurity just means corruption. Corruption, which, which permeates our country. We are not motivated by that, but we are motivated by an exemplary lifestyle. That's purity, a pure lifestyle. And uh, the word impurity is normally related to sexual sin as well. You must be faithful to your wife. Cheaters are the ones being exposed by this verse here. Liars, cheaters. <laughs> we don't motivate people from lies. We uh, no sexual immorality or corruption. And then he continues, or any attempt to deceive. When we go to people and we teach the word, our intention is not for them to give us their money. That's deception. That's why you end up telling people how good they are with their sin and you, you are about to get their feelings so that they can pay and give you money. That, what he was doing here, he was just exposing motivational speakers that are liars out there. That's what they do. They were there. They, and this was more than 2,000 years ago. This Bible is old. Eh? And l l listen to how relevant it still is even in our generation. We have them. You know them. And I'm we are not talking far. They are here. And they do it every week. Encouraging people with lies. Motivating people. And their private lives, their personal lives are also not right. They are not exemplary. They are sinners like nobody's business because they're encouraging others to do the same. Using the word, which is something that is most upsetting to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They use God's word to do those things. And when he continues there, please read verse 11 and 12, uh, Becky. Verse 11. For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own pause, pause there. That's in exhortation. A father will not encourage his young girl to go and sleep around with 15 boys at the same time. A, a father will not do that. And I'm talking just a father here, not even a Christian. <laughs> so as a father to his children, that's that attitude of exhortation because the father has the best interest of this child in his heart so with the gift of exhortation you have the best interest of the people you are teaching or you are speaking to in your heart you want them to have a good relationship with Jesus Christ that's the goal not for you for them to give you money and so that you can drive a Land Rover because that's what they're doing you lie to them they feel good about themselves, they pay you. So you are a hireling, 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 umuhiri. You are a rent, you are not, you are not like, you are not in the family. You are not working for Christ, you are working for yourself. That's what they do, these liars around us. Continue. Verse 12. Uh, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Do you see this? You see the ultimate goal of the gift of exhortation. And he uses many words to, to try and show the depth, the concern, the hunger, 
and the passion of the person with the gift of exhortation. The passion is we exhorted each. That means privately. Each one of you and we encouraged you to walk. So privately he was urging, prodding them. Public, both publicly and privately. Urging them to walk with God in obedience in a manner that is worthy of God. And he even says, I charged you. When you have the, this gift of exhortation, you can even not stop, you can even stop eating for a while. Why? Because you're concerned about the life. I saw him with another girl and I know he's married. And I want to tell him, I can't eat. It concerns me. I must go and talk to him and confront him. You need to stop and walk in a manner worthy of God. Do you see? That's exhortation. What, what Christ taught us in Matthew chapter 18 shouldn't be like, yeah, I caught you, you're a sinner. Ha, yes, no idea, almost. <laughs> That's not the attitude. The attitude is that of concern, not of excitement or yes, Lentatisen does it. Ha. <laughs> do, do you see the attitude in the difference in attitude? The attitude should be I'm so concerned and worried that you, a Christian, cannot do this. For your sake, have a good relationship with Christ. Lukisha, Sukulu Papa. Stop this so that you walk in a way that glorifies God. That's the gift of exhortation. It shows also in music. Those who are gifted in music, when they sing to the Lord, like Mom Ruth is very gifted. You know that by now. She's gifted in singing. What she does is when she sings with that melodical voice, what happens is you listen to the words, right? And then what are the words saying? Believe in God or worship Christ. You see, when you sing spiritual songs, then we are pushing and urging each other to have a relationship. That's the goal. All the gifts, as I started at the beginning, all the gifts, the intention of all the gifts is to make sure people have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why uh, you can preach to a person there, go to uh, Circle Center. You preach to the person, Anapari, hey, yeah, no, this is the truth. I'm convicted. If he doesn't want to come and be a member of Sisho Community Church, we're not going to get, yeah, no, but we worked hard for this. It's ours. No. We are happy that he repented and he's got a good relationship with Jesus. That's the goal. The goal is not for the person to come here. That's not our purpose. But uh, those who are corrupt, those who are deceiving, those who are motivating people to just be comfortable in their sin, they want <laughs> We don't do that. We want people to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's it. There's many more I want to say, but my time is up as you heard my time are beeping here. It's, it is signaling me that that's enough for today. With those words, I want to say, with the gift of exhortation, gift of teaching, again, they work hand in glove. Just like the gift of service and helping, they work together. Let's go and do those gifts. Let's practice them. Let's be doers of God's word. Because if we don't do them, then it all, we are a criticizer in the church. A person who doesn't practice their own gift ends up being coming to church with a red pen. Oh, they did that right? Nah, they did this wrong. Wherever you see wrong, the attitude is, let me help. This is the church of Christ, not of Antatisia, not of Murudira Morocco, but it is the church of Jesus Christ, and I am a follower of who? Of Jesus Christ. And Buntatisia, they are teaching me to follow who? 
not to follow Sisho Community Church, not to follow Mruti, but to follow Christ. Now, if Christ gives you the gift for his sake, practice the gift. Use the gift to benefit other people. That's the intention of the gift. Let's pray. Lord, we come to your throne of grace and we thank you for your teaching. We thank you for your admonition, your correction, your rebuke. Help us, Lord, where we are slacking. Help us to go and obey your word and be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray.